Hello, everyone. Um, uh, you can see my title, and this is also the title of uh, my forthcoming book that's scheduled for publication sometime next year. You can find uh, a fairly complete draft of the book, uh, video lectures, a copy of these slides, uh, and other material at my website. The purpose of the book is to provide a new conceptual framework for reinforcement learning and its connections with the traditional control methodologies of uh, model predictive control and adaptive control. <coughs> uh, the book is uh, based on uh, visualization and, uh, and uh, geometric interpretations for the most part. Um, on the other hand, there is quite a bit of mathematical analysis uh, that is uh, given in my earlier books that supports the visualization. Um, so I'd like to start uh, with uh, two remarkable programs. The first program is Alpha Zero, which uh, plays chess and created a sensation uh, when it came out in 2017. And the other program is much earlier from 25 years ago. It's called TD Gamma. Uh, and uh, it's uh, plays back Gamma. Uh, and uh, uh, at that time, it created a lot of enthusiasm about the prospects of reinforcement learning. So I was talking about Alpha Zero and TD Gamma. And these two programs are very remarkable, even though they were quite a few years apart uh, uh, when they were, uh, they were implemented. Uh, they are quite similar. And both of them involve two algorithms. Uh, some people don't quite realize that there are two algorithms that are involved in these programs. One algorithm is the offline training algorithm by which the program learns how to evaluate positions and also how to select moves in given positions. And uh, this is done with a lot of data, neural network approximations and so on. The second algorithm is online play algorithm, which is uh, what the program uses to play against other computer programs or human opponents. And uh, it is based on multi-step look ahead, uh, rollout and cross-function approximations. And all of this has strong connections with dynamic programming, the classical method of policy iteration and uh, reinforcement learning type of approximations. And what I'm going to try to do in this talk is aim to understand this methodology so that it applies far more generally, and particularly uh, on issues of how it uh, connects with uh, control system design methods of MPC, model predictive control, and also adaptive control. Um, but there are extensions in a broader context, for example, discrete optimization, integer programming, and the like, although I'm not going to talk about those in this particular talk. Okay, I'm going to start describing the online play algorithm in AlphaZero, AlphaGo, and other uh, related uh, uh, TD Gammon and other uh, settings. And then I'm going to discuss the offline uh, training algorithm. Now, the online play algorithm is what you see here in blue, okay? Uh, the Online play algorithm uses the results of offline training at two points. Um, it uses a position evaluator to evaluate positions and a base player that it uh, generates moves at given positions. So this is online uh, play, but there is crucially uh, used information uh, by the off provided by the offline training algorithm. And uh, here, what we're trying to do is improve the base player, the one trained offline, by the following process. Uh, given that we are at, a, at some position, let's say after k moves, the current position xk, we search forward for several moves through a look ahead tree of moves and counter moves up to a certain depth. Then from the leaves of that tree, we simulate the base player for some move, more moves. And then we arrive at some positions here, 
which we evaluate using the position evaluate, evaluator, and we approximate the effect of these future moves by using that evaluation. And now we back up these values back to the root and we calculate a value of each possible move at the current position and we play the best move. So that's what we do at a given position. And then we go to the next position after one move and do the same thing and so on. Now, all of these programs use destruction, but there are differences. Uh, alpha zero does not use this middle portion. Uh, it uses a very long initial portion. The look ahead portion is very long and does not need to use this middle portion. Alpha Go uses a version of this middle portion. Uh, TD Gammon use, relies very much on the middle portion because the look ahead portion is short in TD Gammon. TD Gammon plays back gamut, which is a stochastic game, and the look ahead tree expands very quickly. So it cannot use long look ahead. So it relies on this uh, uh, middle portion the truncated rollout. In fact, the term rollout was, uh, was coined by the originator of 3D Gamma, Jerry Tesoro, and I'm using the term here in the same way that he has used it. Um, there are also similarities with model predictive control. Uh, model predictive control structures are remarkable, remarkably similar to this structure and to the alpha zero structure. There is an initial look ahead portion where minimization takes place. This is called the control interval. And then there is sometimes a rollout portion, which is called the prediction interval. And, uh, and then there's a terminal cost approximation. So uh, model prediction control is uh, quite, uh, it's pretty close to this structure, except some of the, uh, some of the parts are implemented differently because model predictive control deals with uh, infinite state and control spaces for the most part, whereas these games deal with discrete state spaces. So let me go now into the offline training algorithm alpha zero. It is approximate policy iteration uh, with uh, self-generated data. Uh, what we do here is generate a sequence of players and the current player is used to train an improved player. And this process is repeated several times until we stop somewhere and we give the trained player at the end to the online play algorithm. So uh, policy iteration has two parts, every step, uh, policy evaluation, policy improvement. These are done approximately with, with neural networks. So the current player uh, is evaluated by playing many games, collecting data, and uh, uh, representing its evaluation uh, by a neural network, uh, which is trained with uh, lots and lots of data. Now, once we have this evalu this, the evaluation of the current player, we can improve, approximately improve the current player by using multi-step look ahead minimization uh, and uh, uh, an approximate form that's called Monte Carlo tree search. And the improved player, after we collect all this data from the improved player, we represent it with a policy neural network through training. So we have a sequence of value and policy networks generated here, and these are given at the end to the online player for use of, for online play. Now, TD Gammon uses a very similar policy iteration algorithm for offline training using the so-called TD Lambda method. It uses, it generates, it, it uses, it, uh, it, uh, it does not have a policy network. The functionality of the policy network is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is provided by using the value network through one step look ahead. And it also does not use Monte Carlo tree search. And, that's not really fundamental and does not really affect the overall uh, character of the process. So here are some major empirical observations that I want to focus on. Here's the online player. It uses uh, an offline 
player that has been trained with neural networks, but the online player plays much better in alpha zero than the offline trained player. This is just a fact. And it's an obvious fact for people that, uh, that, uh, that have used these programs. Um, the online player of alpha zero is just a phenomenal chess player. By contrast, the offline player is relatively mediocre. And uh, so there's tremendous uh, performance improvement by having online play on top of offline training. Uh, TD Gammon um, plays much better with this middle portion, the truncated rollout portion, than without the rollout portion. Now, Tesoro had uh, two programs in the 90s. The first one was uh, in 1991, and it was based on this structure, but without the middle portion. Then in 1996, he introduced the middle portion, the rollout portion, and he found a great deal of improvement. The 1991 uh, uh, program was playing, uh, his performance was uh, subhuman. It was, uh, was being beaten by the best humans. By contrast, the 1996 uh, program uh, had superhuman performance and has not been improved since that time. Now, these are empirical facts. Uh, and what we like to do is to explain them, provide, draw insights from them, and, uh, and uh, generalize them for, to other contexts by using abstract dynamic programming ideas, abstract Bellman operators, visualization for the most part to draw insight. And we will focus on the central law of Newton's method. This is the Q the key new research that I'm going to present today, how Newton's method ties everything together. So here are the principal viewpoints of this talk. Uh, I'm gonna show you that online play is just a single step of Newton's method for solving the Bellman equation associated with the problem, the dynamic programming problem. This is true for one step look ahead. In the case of multi-step look ahead, the Newton step is preceded by some value iterations. Uh, in the parlance of uh, numerical analysis, this is called a Newton SOR method. It's a well-known method uh, with a lot of literature. SOR stands for successive over relaxation. Uh, and uh, so, so online play is a Newton step. Uh, Offline training, on the other hand, provides the starting point for the Newton step. And in my opinion, online play is a real workhorse. Everything happens in online play. The big performance improvement is during online play. By comparison, offline training plays a secondary role. And a major reason for this is that online play is an exact Newton step. It does not involve approximations. Uh, it's not degraded by neural network uh, training errors. Um, so uh, that, uh, that makes it uh, different and much more powerful. Now, the offline training can be done by many different methods. Uh, in reinforcement learning, we have temporal differences methods, aggregation, we have linear programming. There are many different ways to do the offline training. However, these differences and the various imperfections of these methods affect only the starting point, but they do not affect at all the Newton step, which is exact, and they're all washed out by the Newton step. The Newton step is a big equalizer. Errors that you may make in offline training are washed out by the Newton step. Now there's a cultural difference between the reinforcement learning artificial intelligence community uh, and the control community, uh, particularly model balistic and adaptive control. People in reinforcement learning focus primarily on offline training issues, whereas people in model predictive control uh, are focused largely on online play and also stability issues which are not dealt with by reinforcement learning community almost at all. So here's 
So we're going to try to bridge this gap through these visualizations. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about adaptive control, uh, but instead of using the re-optimization in response to changes in the estimated model, uh, we're going to use multi-step look ahead and roll out. And, uh, and, and the, this framework is going to involve an exact Newton step instead of re-optimization, but applied to a changing Bellman equation, changing in response to a system identification process. But the bottom line is that it's still a Newton step and it's very powerful. Now, all of this applies in great generality. Abstract dynamic programming is a very general uh, framework. Uh, it uh, can accommodate arbitrary state and control spaces, stochastic systems, deterministic systems, hybrid systems uh, uh, involving both discrete and, uh, and continuous uh, uh, state space and uh, control space components, multi-agent systems, games and minimax, uh, finite horizon, infinite horizon, discrete optimization, integer programming. Dynamic programming is a very, very general methodology and abstract dynamic programming captures this generality. And because everything I'm going to talk about is couched within, uh, couched on the abstract dynamic programming framework, it has, uh, it has very broad uh, uh, applications. Now, some of these viewpoints may be a little controversial and personal. So I thought of showing you this cartoon. Uh, these two people look at the same number and this guy says it's a six, but this guy insists it's a nine. And uh, I think this cartoon may have some relevance uh, to, to my talk today. So let me give you an outline. First, I'm going to talk about discounted and undiscounted infinite horizon problems to provide some uh, context. Uh, then uh, I'm going to talk about abstract dynamic programming, the abstract Bellman operators. Um, then I'm going to show by visualization how online play can be viewed as a Newton step. Uh, then discuss stability issues, the region of stability and how you can visualize it. Uh, visualization of uh, rollout, truncated rollout and policy duration. Uh, then I'm going to talk about a familiar problem, the classical linear quadratic problem, where the visualizations are in terms of uh, Riccati equation operators, as opposed to Bellman operators. Then I'm going to discuss application model predictive control and the connections there, and then also adaptive control, indirect adaptive control with uh, model estimation. So let me start with uh, uh, discounted and undiscounted infinite horizon problems. So what we have here is a system, discrete time system. Excuse me. Involving a state which I denote by xk, it's a state of time k, a control uk, and a random disturbance. Wk is random, and the system evolves according to this equation. And uh, uh, we're interested in stationary policies that map state into controls. And uh, this control might satisfy a uh, uh, control constraint for every X. Uh, there is a cost for its transition, uh, this uh, encoded by this function uh, G, and the cost is discounted by a factor alpha. Alpha could be less than one or could be equal to one. And at the at uh, stage k, the, the cost is discounted by alpha to k. And the cost of a policy starting from some initial condition x0 is just a limit of the end stage cost. This denotes expected value over all the w's. This is a random variable, and we take this expected value and take the limit as the, the number of stages n goes to infinity. So this is a function. For every state, there is a value here given by this function and the optimal cost function is obtained by minimizing overall overall policies uh, the policy cost functions and uh, i have in mind primarily three contexts 
One is discounted problems where alpha is strictly less than one and G is bounded. This is a nice case. Everything I'm going to talk about is correct for discounted problems. Now for other problems, uh, there may be exceptions and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I'm going to mention a few of those as I go along. Uh, the second class of problems is stochastic shortest path problems where there's a special cost-free termination state. Think of the origin as being a termination state and alpha is equal to one. And then the MPC type of problems where the, the system is deterministic, the cost per stage is positive, the origin is the termination state, and this is a regulation problem. The aim is to drive the state to the origin or keep it close to the origin. And this uh, is encoded in this positive cost. The cost is zero at the termination state, positive everywhere else. So these are the problems I have in mind. And let me give you a synopsis of the theory. The first result is that J star, the optimal cost function, satisfies Bellman's equation. Now there is one such scalar equation for every state. So this is a functional equation. And J star satisfies this equation, um, often uniquely, but not necessarily. That's why I have these question marks. Uh, there's an optimality condition. If for a given X, mu stars of X attains the minimum in this equation for every X, then the policy that you obtain is optimal. Again, there are some exceptions to that. Um, and there are, regarding algorithms, the first major algorithm is value iteration. It generates a sequence of cost functions starting from some J zero, which can be more or less arbitrary and uses this recursion here, this iteration, which is just the right-hand side of the Bellman equation, but with JK minus one replacing J star. This generates a sequence of finite horizon costs uh, uh, and uh, uh, it's one of the major algorithms. The other major algorithm is policy iteration, generates a sequence of policies, mu k, and their cost functions. Mu zero is arbitrary. The typical iteration starts with some policy mu and generates a new policy, mu tilde. I'm going to be using these symbols a lot in this talk. Mu for current policy, mu tilde for the next policy. Uh, in two steps, there's a policy evaluation step that computes the cost function J mu. And there is a policy improvement step that calculates the improved policy by using this equation here, by doing for every X this minimization, which is the same minimization as in Bellman's equation, except that we use J mu, the cost of the uh, current policy in place of J star. Okay. So now let's talk about approximation in value space, a major approximate dynamic programming reinforcement learning framework. Uh, here we act, we, we, it's very difficult to find J star. So you replace it with an approximation J tilde in Bellman's equation. And when we arrive at a state X, we perform this minimization, which balances the cost of the first stage plus the future cost as evaluated using this J tilde and also appropriately discounted. This minimization is over all the possible controls at the given state and provides a control to use. So we apply this control and then we go to the next stage. At the next state, we apply, we do the same minimization, this type of minimization again, and we proceed going forward. This is called one step look ahead because we look forward only one step before going to the approximation. Multi-step look ahead is sort of the same thing except that we minimize the cost of the first L stages plus the future cost as evaluated by J tilde. And now this is an L step problem and it involves minimization over our control UK and policies from K plus one to K plus L minus one, we solve this problem and we use at XK this first control and we throw away all the rest. Either way, one step look ahead or multi-step look ahead, 
This defines a look ahead policy. Mu tilde, mu tilde so of xk is the control that's obtained from this minimization. It's the minimizing uk. I'm going to be using a lot of the symbols. J tilde is cost approximation. Mu tilde is the look ahead policy obtained by either one step look ahead or multi step look ahead. And here's the key fact J mu tilde, the cost function of the look ahead policy, is a result of a Newton step for solving Bellman's equation starting from J tilde. Now, this is true for one step look ahead. Uh, for multi-step look ahead, uh, L greater than one is the result of a Newton SOR step, which is some value iterations followed by a Newton step. Either way, the error decreases super linearly. That's a generic and the key property of uh, Newton's method, whereby uh, the errors that uh, diminish very rapidly, and in particular, this ratio goes to zero as, uh, as J tilde uh, gets to close uh, and tends to J star. So you had an error in cost between J tilde and J star, and you have a new error after the Newton step that gives you the cost of the look ahead policy uh, compared with J star. And this numerator is tiny relative to the denominator. These errors reduce very fast superlinearly. So now let me go into abstract dynamic programming concepts and how you interpret all this in terms of Bellman operators and through visualization. Okay. So here's the Bellman operator. It's the right-hand side of what you have in Bellman's equation. And it maps cost functions J into cost functions T mu sub J. So J has a component for every X. T mu sub J has a component also for every X. And it's given by this expression involving the cost of the first stage using mu and the cost of the remaining stages as measured by j. So there's one such equation, a scalar equation for every x. And I call this the mu Bellman operator. And there's also the min Bellman operator, which is the one that appears at the right hand side of Bellman's equation. And it involves minimization here over all controls. And if you take this values here and minimize over mu, what you get is Tj's of x. Again, j is a function of the state. Tj is also a function of the state. So this is a functional, this is an operator mapping functions into functions. And Bellman's equation can be written in shorthand by using these operators. The min Bellman uh, equation is represented as a fixed point equation. J star is a fixed point of T. And there is a Bellman equation for every policy. J mu, for a policy mu, J mu, the cost of that policy is a fixed point of this mu Bellman operator. So T mu and T transform real valued functions J into functions T mu so J and P sub J. And for this talk, I'm going to assume that these are real valued. Now, these are pretty big operators. How many dimensions so do they have? Uh, well, for every X, there's a scalar equation. So the dimension is the number of states. It could be astronomical or it could be infinite. On the other hand, for every X, these are real values functions of J. And uh, you can uh, view them in uh, uh, for for, the, for a single uh, state. Okay, as an example, suppose you have a two state system, then J is a two dimensional vector, J1, J2. This is a real number, this is a real number. This is a vector in R2. And T sub J has two components. It's also a vector in R2, the components Tj of one and Tj of two. So, even for a two-state system, we have uh, an operator that's uh, 
maps uh, two-dimensional space to two-dimensional space, so you need a four-dimensional graph to represent it. That poses a little bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, but on the other hand, even though team U and T are large and perhaps difficult to visualize, uh, look at first sight, they have some nice properties. The first is that they are both monotone. As you increase uniformly the J function here and here, T mu sub J and TJ also increase. The reason is that uh, the expectation preserves monotonicity. Expectation means uh, a positive uh, linear combination. So it has the monotonicity property. And similarly here, as you increase J because of the monotonicity, because of the, the expectation of operator preserves its monotonicity and the minimization also preserves monotonicity, you have that uh, T mu and T are monotone. As another important fact is that T mu is linear. Okay, expectation is a linear operation. So this is a linear operator. T on the other hand is concave. It's concave because it represents, it can be viewed as the minimum of linear operations. If you take the minimum of linear operations, then you get uh, something that's concave. So in particular for every fixed state X, Tj of X is a concave function of J, not of X of J. J remember is a function, T of J is also uh, a, uh, a, uh, a, a function of J that's concave in the traditional form, in the traditional, uh, 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 traditional meaning of convex analysis. So for infinite dimensional state space, T mu and T are infinite dimensional operators mapping an infinite dimensional functions in the function space into itself. So now the question is, how do we deal? We want to do visualization with these operators. How do we do that? Okay, so what we do is use one dimensional slices of, this, uh, of, this, uh, of the graphs of these operators. To give you an idea of this, let's consider a two state and two control example. We already have a four dimensional graph, but we can represent as two three dimensional graphs. And I'm going to do it here. Okay, blue stands for the new operator, and red starts for the stands for the uh, for the uh, the min operator. Here is the T mu operator, and it has two components: one for state one and one for state two. And I'm showing these components here for state one and for state two. And this is linear and monotone, and this is concave and monotone. So for state one, um, there are two controls here. Each control defines each control defines a uh, a, a a linear has a linear graph. It's the blue graph that you see here. Here is j one, j two, and this is a, the linear function t mu of j of one for state one. Now the min Bellman operator is obtained by, by minimizing over these two. So it's a piecewise linear function. It has this red uh, graph here that you see. It's a function of J1 and J2. And uh, I'm showing also J star here. J star is, uh, is, uh, is shown right here. And I want, you, I want to focus attention on the fact that we can consider slices, one dimensional slices that go through J star. And you can see this slice here. By using one dimensional slices, we're able to visualize this operator uh, on a piece of paper rather than and, and, and deal with a high dimensionality. So there's a slice like that for state one, and there's also a slice like that for state two. And the slice involves a piecewise linear monotone function you can see the 45 degree line here. And uh, so that's a visualization for a two by two problem. And from now on, we're going to be focusing on one dimensional slices that pass through J star. 
Okay, so let's visualize the new Bellman operator. Uh, it's given by this equation. The mu Bellman equation is this, J mu is a fixed point of T mu. And the operator has a linear graph. It's this blue line that you see here that defines T mu sub J as a function of J. And to find the cost of mu, J mu, I have to find the point where this blue line meets the 45 degree line. And this is the fixed point of the operator T mu. And it is the cost of mu, satisfies the Bellman equation. Of course, this cost has to be somewhere further to the right of the optimal cost. And all of these costs are to the right. There are many of these uh, mu operators and they are all they are defined by in a similar way. Okay, now the min Bellman operator. The min Bellman operator is obtained by minimizing overall controls or minimizing over all these blue uh, operators for a given X. It's concave and monotone and it's defined as follows. Here is T sub J, this red graph here as a function of J. And uh, to obtain its value, let's say at a some point J tilde, we have to consider all the policies, find the point of intersection of these policies with this vertical line and go to the lowest point. This is the minimum over policies of T mu sub J tilde. So that's how you find T sub J tilde, and you do the same for every J. And basically the red curve is the lower envelope of the, uh, of the blue lines. You have all these blue lines and what lies below that is the graph of the min operator. And now the optimal cost J star is obtained as the fixed point of this, uh, uh, of this, of the operator T. It is the point where the red curve meets the 45 degree line. So that's how you visualize J star and all these operators and the connection of the blue operators with the red operator. Uh, I think to notice is that uh, uh, the red operator is uh, concave. And also at J tilde, the blue operator that attains the minimum is tangent, provides a linearization of the uh, red operator at this point. Now this linearization is going to be key for understanding the role of Newton's method. So uh, let me also illustrate how value iteration can be viewed within this operator context. Uh, we have uh, T sub J as a function of J. And in value iteration, we generate a sequence of cost functions. We start with some J zero and we find TJ zero, okay? It's, this is J one. Uh, then we reflect J one across the 45 degree line to this point here, and then apply T to it and we obtain then the second iterator, J2. So J2 is T squared J0. We reflect it again across the 45 degree line and we obtain J2, I'm sorry, J3 and so on. So there is this staircase construction that, visual, that provides a visualization of, uh, of value iteration. And you can see that uh, uh, there's a tendency to converge to the fixed point, but not always. It depends on, uh, on what uh, J0 is, the slope of T. In particular, if T is a contraction mapping, which means that the slope is uniformly less than one, then uh, you get convergence and you get also a unique fixed point. But in, that's the favorable case, but that doesn't always hold true. So that's the visualization for, uh, for value iteration. And uh, now let me 
go into Newton's method and its connection with online play and uh, one step uh, look ahead. Okay, so let's look at the familiar Newton's method for solving a fixed point problem, uh, finding a fixed point of uh, the operator T. Uh, this is a generic operator here, and I'm showing it in red, concave and monotone uh, as it is in dynamic programming. And Newton's method is an iterative method. It generates a sequence of uh, iterates, JK. You start at J0, generate J1, J2, and so on. At the typical step, you are at JK. And what you do is you linearize T at JK. And this blue line is the linearization. It involves uh, the first order Taylor series expansion of T at the point JK. We now solve the linearized fixed point equation. In other words, we find this point here, and that's the new iterate JK plus one. So that's what Newton's uh, method does. And it's pretty similar to one of the things I showed you earlier for online play and for uh, one step look ahead. Uh, so JK linearization, solve the linearized problem JK plus one, then linearize at this point, solve the linearized problem, obtain JK plus two and so on. And you can see that this process can be very fast, indeed quadratic under the right conditions. Um, and uh, okay, I've shown also here T to be differentiable, but then we will relax this assumption uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in what follows. So this is generic Newton's method. And here, here is how it relates to, uh, to one step look ahead. Now, in one step look ahead, what we do is we have a J tilde, a cost approximation, and we find new tilde, a one step look ahead policy, which is obtained by minimizing overall possible policies. So what one step look ahead does is it linearizes T at J tilde and obtains this blue operator, which is the look ahead policy new tilde. So how do we represent the cost function of this look ahead policy? Well, it is simply the intersection of this blue line with a 45 degree line, and it gives you J mu tilde as the fixed point of T mu tilde. So we start with this cost approximation and we end up with this one step look ahead policy cost. And you can see that it is an honest to goodness Newton step. Now it's a key insight, but then immediately some questions arise. In the classical form of Newton's method, you have to have this T uh, operator be differentiable, twice, differ well, once differentiable. Do we need that? Well, the answer is no, you don't need that. You can substitute concavity and monotonicity for differentiability. This is known uh, in uh, numerical analysis. If you look at the classical books like Ortega and Reinbold from, from the 60s, there, are, uh, there, are, uh, there is theory associated with that, primarily with monotonicity. Uh, the, but but it's, also, it, it's also true that you don't have to have uh, differentiability here concavity is sufficient because this blue line in the, in the case of a non-differentiable operator is just a subgradient. You use subgradients instead of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, derivatives uh, and gradients. And the, the important thing is that you have a tangent hyperplane, a supporting hyperplane. And this can be provided by a subgradient or by a gradient uh, just as well. Now you do need some assumptions for this process to, to be valid because there are all sorts of anomalies that can occur here, but everything works out fine for contractive problems such as the discounted problem that I gave earlier. And notice one more thing. The Newton step is very fast, has super linear convergence. 
So it smooths out starting point variations. If you make variations to J tilde, there will be corresponding variations to J mu tilde, but these variations are tiny relative to these variations. So you may make some errors here, and these are smoothed out by the Newton step. And there's lots of empirical evidence uh, uh, to support uh, all this. Okay, now let me go into stability issues and how do how we visualize them. Um, here I'm going to be focusing mostly on the MPC context, deterministic system, cost-free terminal state, and so on. So stability is of paramount importance, of course, in MPC. But the question arises: how do you define stability given that the that the state space can be discrete and can be continuous? So instead of going to concepts of Lyapunov stability and the like, we adopt a, an optimization-based definition of stability. And we say that the policy is stable if its cost function is finite for all x. If the cost of the policy does not blow up for any initial state, then we say that the policy is stable. And this has the advantage, it's a very general definition. And generally, this is true if T mu is a contraction or has slope less than one in the context of uh, our figures. So let's look at one step look ahead. Um, we want to, the region of stability we define to be the set of all J tilde cost approximations for which the look ahead policy is stable. So you can see here that if you choose J tilde to the right of some threshold, then the corresponding policies because of the monotonicity uh, are stable. On the other hand, if you choose them to the left of some threshold, uh, the policies are not stable because they don't intersect basically the 45 degree line. They have slope greater than one. And the threshold is precisely the point where the Bellman operator has a tangent the 45 degree line. So this is how the region of stability is demarcated. J tilde to the right of uh, this threshold point gives you a stable policy and uh, otherwise it's an unstable policy. Of course, this is for a one dimensional slice. For a multi-dimensional case, it's more complicated than that, but the general idea still applies. Now, this is for one step look ahead. Uh, for multi-step look ahead. Now, multi-step look ahead tends to push J tilde into the stable region. Uh, now, remember that multi-step look ahead amounts to some value iterations and then taking the Newton step. So this gives you an example where a two-step look ahead. So what are the stable J tilde? The ones that after you perform, after you perform one value iteration, you cross into this stable region for one step look ahead. So the threshold moves to the right and the region of stability is expanded by multi-step look ahead. And there are rigorous studies, uh, mathematical uh, analysis that, that verify this. And it's also a known fact in MPC. So it makes sense to push J tilde towards J mu, which is stable. And that's uh, what uh, this multi-step look ahead does. And it's also an idea that underlies the concept of rollout. So now let me go into rollout and the policy iteration and how we visualize them. Okay, now rollout is simply a Newton step starting from J tilde equal to the cost function of a policy. So you have some policy new, which we call base policy. It has an evaluation, okay, obtained by this intersection point. This is J mu. And then rollout does a Newton step, linearizes here, and this gives you the rollout policy. So that's uh, simply what it is. 
and it can be implemented uh, in a number of ways, including simulation. And an interesting fact is that if you have a stable policy to begin with, then the rollout policy will also be stable. You can see this from this figure. Now, policy iteration is simply a repeated rollout. You start from a policy, do a rollout on it, and then do a rollout on the rollout, and so on, and generate a sequence of policies. The visualization is the following. Let's say new K is the current policy, and this is its evaluation, the cost of new K. You do a Newton step linearize the Bellman equation at j nu k, then obtain nu k plus one. This is the policy improvement step, policy evaluation, policy improvement, and obtain a new policy and its cost is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is obtained by the new policy is this corresponds to this blue line and its cost is obtained by uh, projecting on the horizontal this point of intersection. So start with mu k, generate mu k plus one, then generate mu k plus two and so on and converge very fast. The pure form of policy iteration is exactly Newton's method and does not rely on differentiability at all. Uh, uh, the fact that the connection with Newton's method actually is well known in control theory uh, starting from Kleinman's paper on linear quadratic problems. Kleinman was a student of Mike Athens at MIT and wrote this paper that, uh, that uh, was followed up by a lot of other works, both for linear quadratic problems and also for more general uh, forms of policy duration. There are also corresponding results in the Markov decision process theory all of this is very well known in dynamic programming as well as uh, uh, linear quadratic problems and the like. Um, okay, so now let's go into truncated rollout. Rollout is a single step of uh, Newton, single Newton step starting from the base policy. Truncated rollout starts from some J tilde, does several value iterations using the mu operator, and then at that point takes the Newton step. So it is first value iterations with, with the mu operator, uh, m of them, m equals four in this particular figure, uh, starting with some j tilde, and then uh, applying the Newton step by doing this minimization here. And that's the cost of the truncated rollout policy. So truncated rollout also involves a Newton step. Now you can have a combination of uh, L step look ahead minimization and M step truncated rollout. And the total look ahead is L plus M. <clears throat> and an interesting fact, it is that the sum that's important not so much the individual values of L and M, but the sum is important. Now, rollout with a policy is much cheaper than look ahead minimization. So uh, truncated rollout can be viewed as an economical substitute for multi-step look ahead. And this was the motivation of Tesoro when he introduced truncated rollout in the context of backgammon. <clears throat> uh, also people use this rationale in MPC. Um, use uh, uh, rollout with some base stable policy to, um, to enhance the starting point for the Newton step. So now let me go into a familiar problem for people in control, the linear quadratic problem. In uh, linear quadratic problems, there are similar visualizations, but instead of using the Bellman operator, we use the Riccardi equation operator. So in this particular, for illustration, I'm using a, a one dimensional linear system with an A coefficient and a B coefficient, a quadratic cost involving non-negative Q and R coefficients and alpha equals one, no discounting. And it is well known that the optimal uh, cost function is quadratic uh, with quadratic coefficient K star 
And this K star solves the Riccati equation. And the Riccati equation is a fixed point equation, it's the algebraic Riccati equation, and it's given by this expression here involving A, B, R, and, uh, and Q is concave. And uh, the solution of the Riccati equation is obtained by intersection of this 45 degree line and the red graph here. Actually, there are two solutions. However, there's a unique solution uh, that is positive. And this other, this other solution that's, uh, that uh, is not positive. Uh, this, uh, in fact, this is true for, for multidimensional problems. Um, the normal case is when Q and R are positive and uh, K star has its unique positive, so is its unique positive solution. However, just to sensitize you to exceptions, here's an exceptional case where Q is equal to zero. And now the, in that case, you lose observability but, uh, but K star is actually equal to zero because there's only cost on control and you can set the control to zero and attain optimal cost of zero. However, the Riccati equation has two non-negative solutions and there's another solution here, which has an interesting interpretation. And this is an example where you don't have the uniqueness. And in fact, if you try value iteration for this exceptional case, you'll find that value iteration converges to the to the non-optimal solution rather than K star. Um, this is just an example of exceptional behavior and there are many of those in other contexts that are more complicated than linear quadratic. Okay, so here's a common question. Uh, in the end, I want to have a policy and I, we say that this online play policy is good. Why can I not learn this policy by some neural network and use it? Um, in fact, there is a whole community in reinforcement learning that uh, practices approximation in policy space, where we don't care about cost function approximations, multi-step look ahead and the like, but instead we parameterize the policy and we optimize the parameters by using some kind of training, perhaps neural network training. There are methods called policy gradient methods, random search methods, and so on. There's a wide variety. It's a very broad field. And my visualizations and my point of view suggest that this viewpoint is flawed because it lacks the exact Newton step that sort of does all the magic. It corrects all the errors of offline training and super linearly so. So there's no correction mechanism in this, uh, in this uh, approach whereby we don't use a Newton step. And uh, to illustrate this point, I have an example here. It's a one dimensional linear quadratic example with a known and fixed model. And we, we consider a parametrization of the policy. We use linear feedback policies with coefficient L. And L, we vary L, okay? This is the L, we vary it uh, broadly. Um, okay, L around minus 0.4 is optimal. And what I have plotted here are the cost differences from the optimum without the Newton step, just this policy, apply this policy we see that very quickly, the performance of the policy is degraded. On the other hand, if you introduce one step look ahead, in other words, if you introduce a Newton step, then the performance is almost indistinguishable from the optimal. So all this is, is the loss that you incur for not having a Newton step to correct the errors in the suboptimal policy parameterization. Let me say a few things about model predictive control. Well, I'm not uh, doing very badly with time. I'm glad about that. So I'm going to uh, go a little slowly here. Okay, model predictive control is a very, uh, is a major methodology, perhaps a dominant methodology in control theory research these days. It dates to uh, 
close to 40 years uh, and has extensive literature. It has been applied to very, very challenging problems. There's a lot of experience with it. Uh, the classical form of MPC applies to continuous state and control uh, uh, problems, deterministic problems with positive cost. So we have a nonlinear system uh, and the cost function is positive everywhere except at the origin where the cost is zero. So basically this encodes our desire to drive the system to the origin and keep it there. Uh, and uh, now MPC is culturally different from uh, the, uh, the reinforcement learning artificial intelligence practice of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, sequential decision making. Uh, the, the architecture of MPC, as I mentioned earlier, is very similar to Alpha Zero. It includes look ahead minimization, which is often called controlled interval. Uh, in some versions of MPC, there's a so-called prediction interval to improve the terminal cost approximation, and there is a, which amounts to rollout with some stable policy. And uh, there is also a terminal cost function that's being used. So all the elements are there. On the other hand, MPC focuses on continuous space applications and also stability issues and also uh, relies primarily on online play. Uh, there is some online offline training in NPC, for example, computing offline terminal cost approximations, computing some stable policies to do rollout with, and also computing target tubes, uh, safe regions in order to deal with state constraints. Uh, one of the central motivations of MPC is to be able to deal with uh, state constraints, critical state constraints that uh, for which uh, uh, the linear quadratic uh, unconstrained framework does not deal very well. Uh, so uh, to do that, there are some interesting issues of how to, to keep, to, 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 to use controls, to select controls that keep you within the safe region. And there's a theory of, um, uh, target to principality, which actually is very dear to my heart because my PhD thesis uh, 50 years ago uh, dealt precisely uh, with this topic of uh, the no introducing the notion of target tube and also uh, how you construct these target tubes. Um, my, nobody read my thesis for about 15 years, but then all of a sudden through MPC, it became an interesting topic. Okay, so this is the classical form of MPC, but there are a lot of uh, extensions. And uh, you can look at, uh, for example, the recent books by Rollins, Main, and Deal, and uh, Borelli, Bemporad, and Morari, which describe a lot of, uh, a lot of extensions uh, that deal with stochastic uncertainties, hybrid systems involving both continuous and discrete control and space components, minimax versions, uh, uh, deal with target tubes uh, and so on. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, very broad literature dealing with a broad variety of problems. Moreover, uh, more recently there has been a, uh, some uh, emphasis on getting on using data, uh, simulation obtained data and rollout with a, some offline trained policy. And uh, this come under the general name of uh, learning at NPC. Uh, this term was introduced in the paper by Rosolia and Borelli who have done interesting work uh, in this area. And there has been also a recent paper by Yu Chao Li uh, and Johansson and Martinson professors at KTH. And I'm also a co-author in uh, this paper. Uh, so now let me go into adaptive control with model estimation, what's called indirect adaptive control. 
is combine identification, model identification, and adaptation of control in the response. So what we have here is a system that's changing over time. Its model is changing over time. Data is collected from this system and we run a model estimation, a system identification algorithm, the results of which are passed into an adaptive controller who makes uh, proper adaptations. And uh, the indirect adaptive control viewpoint is uh, uh, to re-optimize the controller uh, when the estimated model changes. On the other hand, there's a problem with that. This re-optimization re may be difficult or very time consuming. Uh, so uh, there is room for simpler alternatives. And uh, rollout provides, and, and rollout combined with multi-step look ahead provides uh, such an alternative. Uh, you have, uh, uh, you use multi-step look ahead that takes into account the current model as estimated by the system identification process, but the rollout itself uses some robust policy. However, all of this involves a Newton step. So we use a Newton step instead of re-optimization. And if you're close, if your changes from the nominal are not very serious, then the Newton step, I argue, is just as good as re-optimization and computationally simpler. So we capitalize on the fast convergence of the Newton step to avoid expensive re-optimizations. So that's the idea for the use of rollout in adaptive control as a substitute to re-optimization. And uh, let, me, uh, let me give you an example uh, uh, here. This is a one-dimensional linear system. And uh, uh, it involves an unknown parameter, a changing parameter B. And, uh, and our result may also be variable here in the cost function. Um, now, as B changes, the optimal cost as measured by the quadratic cost coefficient changes. If you use a fixed policy in particular, the policy that is optimal for the nominal values of B equals two and R equals 0.5, then the performance degrades. So robustness is not really fixing the problem here. If you have large deviations from the nom for the nominal parameters, uh, then you can get uh, uh, you can get a lot of degradation performance. On the other hand, if you use rollout, including the Newton step, there's hardly any change from the optimal. It's just as effective as reoptimization. And this is true when we change B, but keep R fixed. And the right figure, we change the cost parameter, the R, and keep B fixed. So this is uh, what I want to say, that using a robust control as a base policy without the Newton step is often flawed. And we correct the flow by introducing uh, the Newton step. OK, let me conclude. Uh, uh, I want to make a few points here. The first one is that there is much to be gained by using online play on top of offline training. There's a potential for very large improvements. Uh, if you just use just offline training without online play, it may not work very well because it, we lack the Newton step that corrects for training errors and can deal with changing system parameters. On the other hand, using just online play without offline training we may miss out on performance because we will not have good starting points for the Newton step. So that's the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is that Newton's method is central in all this. This is a new insight and can guide both analysis, explain behavior, and provide motivation for new algorithmic designs. And again, the Newton step is exact. All the approximations, Newton net, neural networks and the like, go into the starting point for the Newton step, 
which washes out training method differences and errors. Another point is that there's a cultural divide between the between reinforcement learning uh, as practiced by the AI community and the control community. We are dealing with very similar problems using similar methods and the cultural differences can be bridged by combined offline training and online play in the model of alpha zero. Um, MPC uses a very similar architecture to alpha zero but can benefit from RL uh, and artificial intelligence ideas. And we can also approach indirect adaptive control through rollout using a Newton step in place of reoptimization. <clears throat> the last point I want to make is that all of this is very general. Even though I focused on, on just a few problem types, uh, the generality comes from having arbitrary state and control spaces and the generality of abstract dynamic programming. And in particular, there are a lot of uh, uh, interesting applications in discrete optimization, integer programming, multi-agent versions, uh, which uh, uh, involve uh, exploitation of the special structure. Um, and, uh, and a lot of this is in my 2020 book, the details of that. Finally, there are exceptional behaviors all over the place. Once you get away from the benign uh, discounted case, and there's a lot of room for cl cl clarification from, uh, by mathematical analysis and uh, computation experimentation. So uh, let me close with some word words of optimism. <clears throat> the, we had tremendous successes in both artificial intelligence uh, reinforcement learning and MPC. And this provides hope for the future. Uh, more success can be expected by bridging the gap between these two communities. Uh, look ahead minimization and rollout can be a computational bottleneck. And uh, people in both artificial intelligence and MPC have been struggling with that. On the other hand, we have massive computational power uh, through distributed computation. A lot of these computations can be parallelized and all of this power can mitigate the computational bottleneck. And so uh, we can obtain online strategies that are more sophisticated as a result. So all in all, the future looks very bright and uh, I thank you very much for your attendance. <clears throat> All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so please, uh, uh, we have time for questions. It was a very exciting talk. I think I'd like to leave the, the floor open for questions before asking my own questions, if there's time in the end. Um, so uh, we can try if you raise your hand. Yeah. And then I can, can pass the word. So you uh, Kim. You can unmute, maybe, if you want to ask a question. Yes. Uh, so um, uh, let me join Mikkel first by saying a fantastic talk. It really opens up the thought. Yeah. And uh, perhaps my question is because I haven't fully digested the concept yet. But when when I think about uh, this exploration, uh, uh, so alpha, beta, pruning in type of games, and then with a proxy of a cost of future possible steps, uh, I, I tend to view it more as a exploration of state space. So when you take the jump to dynamical systems is the state in the dynamical system the same state that you would apply say to a chessboard or is it more of a, an abstract concept that is used in the analysis or is there a one-to-one -one correspondence there the state space is is arbitrary here uh, the visualizations are valid for an arbitrary state space now in the case of uh, chess and games mm -hmm. the state space is discrete the same is true for markovian decision problem problem that right. are of interest in operations research in other places. In the control uh, in the control applications, it's mostly continuous uh, state space. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the minimization, the look ahead minimization depends very much on the nature of the state space. Indeed, in chess, you have forward search through a tree mm -hmm. uh, with alpha beta pruning and all this other stuff, Monte Carlo tree search, which facilitate and expedite mm -hmm this search. On the other hand, it's a discrete process, search through a tree. 
in mm. MPC, it's a different sort of thing. People in MPC use, uh, use continuous type methods or combinations of continuous and discrete methods that are closer to integer programming, uh, uh, nonlinear programming, so sequential quadratic programming. Um, so depending on the character of the state space, you would use different methods for the look ahead minimization. Uh, mm. The concept, however, is the same. Uh, it's just the, the, the implementation depends on the problem at hand. Mm. I guess my question was, uh, so, so when you interpret it in terms of a control problem, is then does the state describe the whole look ahead process or is it uh, so maybe yeah maybe i just didn't fully understand the um, because but so when you take the control theory view of it um so is the look ahead uh, algorithm something different from the state or is that actually the state in that interpretation so well, that the the, one step of the, this, the state of evolution is supposed to be known here mm. uh, the the system equation is supposed to be known it could be stochastic mm. however we can predict the future fully for a given policy we can predict the future fully that we have a model for it uh, right i don't know if i answered your question i think yeah i have probably have to think about it more but it's input definitely to that thanks okay uh, so, Mario, maybe you can unmute and, and ask a question. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, this talk uh, was extremely inspiring for me. Um, uh, there's one point which uh, maybe I missed. Um, so it's very interesting to see how these uh, these methods are essentially neutral steps. But um, I missed a bit the connection yeah, yeah. with uh, policy gradient methods because yeah. policy gradient methods essentially okay also do something along these lines. They take some sort of a Newton step though approximated depending on which Hessian approximation one uses. So I was wondering if you could comment a bit more on this aspect. Uh, sure, Newton's method uh, can be used in several different uh, optimization contexts. Uh, what I was talking about here is Newton's method for solving fixed point problems, the Bellman equation in particular in policy gradient methods, which is conceptually quite different from the approximation in value space that I've been using here. Uh, in, in policy gradient methods, there's an optimization problem to be solved. And the optimization involves not uh, involves the parameter, it's a parameterization of the policy. So for this, you can use any optimization method that you would like, you can use Newton's method, or you can use a, a gradient method, you can do random search, anything that you would like. But the context is different. The cost function is different. Uh, you in, in, in the policy gradient context, you optimize the performance with respect to the controller parameters, the performance of the system. In here, in my talk, it's Newton's method is used uh, not for an optimization problem, it's used to solve a fixed point problem, which is not the same. Um, right, yeah, maybe what confused me is that in, uh, in policy uh, gradient, you uh, take uh, the expectation over an initial uh, uh, distribution of, over a distribution of initial states. Um, so that's what makes it similar, but yeah, indeed uh, it's, it's a very different uh, kind of uh, optimization problem. Thanks a lot. I see some hands, but I don't hear anybody. Yeah, I was waiting. Mikael, can I go on? You're muted now, Mikael, so that's, that's why we didn't hear you. <laughs> okay, so, so, right. So, so yeah, thanks also. Very, very uh, nice talk. And it's good to see uh, such a broad audience from all over the world uh, in, in, in this talk. I have a uh, control uh, question, uh, uh, Dimitri. So, I mean, you commented on indirect uh, adaptive control and the interpretation here, how, how one could kind of think about this in, in this framework. So, you know, at the time that there was this discussion about different architectures for adaptive control, indirect adaptive control and direct adaptive control and so on. 
So could you comment a little bit on the role of models here? Because in indirect adaptive control, you explicitly have the plant model. You ident identify the plant model and you use that for, for the design. So with your framework here, is it so that, so to say, one can argue that there should be such a model explicit in the architecture for the control? Um, so so, so is, is this, so to say, an argument because that would lead to this particular structure that you pr present here with the online play and offline training? Yes. Uh, uh, speaking of adaptive control, um, I'd like to take the opportunity to pay some tribute to the outstanding contributions of the Swedish uh, uh, mathematicians and control theorists in this area, particularly Carl Astrom, who has been a friend and a source of inspiration for me over many years, um, about the difference between uh, indirect and direct uh, adaptive control. Uh, I don't think from what I can tell that direct adaptive control can fall into the framework that I have discussed because it involves a primarily stability type of analysis and also optimization type of analysis that do not seem to fit the model of dynamic programming very well. It's like in policy gradient methods. So you do an optimization, but does not involve so much dynamic programming. You just optimize uh, in the direct case, direct data control case, you stabilize the system. You try to find parameters that stabilize the system and, and cost is kind of secondary, but sometimes they combine the two. So I'm also not an expert in model uh, in, in, in direct adaptive control, and perhaps uh, someone will be able to find some connections that I don't see right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thanks, Kale. Uh, Turaj. Uh, yes, I uh, have two questions. Uh, the first question is about the convergence rate of uh, value iteration and uh, policy iteration algorithms. Could you please elaborate uh, a bit on uh, this point and uh, in particular, how can we uh, make them faster? And the second question is about the optimality gap of uh, rollout algorithms. Uh, in, I mean, by um, optimality gap, I mean the difference between the cost of uh, the drive policy and JSTAR. Uh, do you think if we can uh, m uh, find any bound on the optimality gap of these algorithms? Um, yeah, the issue of convergence rate, at least for the, the simpler cases, uh, is fairly, uh, fairly clear. Value iteration has a linear convergence rate. Um, and is much slower than policy iteration. Policy iteration has a super linear convergence rate. Converges in a finite number of iterations if the state space, if the number of policies is finite. So policy iteration is much faster and rollout takes advantage of that, uh, of that, uh, uh, of, of that uh, uh, fast convergence. Um, it's uh, computation studies are show very remarkably how effective rollout is, even though it's a single iteration, particularly if you have a good starting point that's obtained by some kind of offline training, it just works wonders. It's just, and it's very reliable also. So while there are error bounds, if you look at iBooks, for example, there are error bounds associated with rollout, policy iteration, value iteration, and so on with approximations. Uh, with J tilde approximations. Uh, these error bounds are interesting mathematically, but they are very conservative and they don't really tell the whole story. They sort of point the direction toward which performance uh, tends to go. But uh, uh, I would not rely on these bounds very much to draw quantitative conclusions or base design decisions on those. So all in all, Policy iteration is very effective, but I cannot fully justify uh, the, um, uh, my argument. On the other hand, there's like a 50 year experience uh, on, the, on this methodology. And uh, what I'm saying is pretty reliable uh, based on just the experimental evidence. Thank you. 
<clears throat> Excellent. Uh, are there any other questions? Maybe I can take the opportunity to ask one. Um, so, so if I understand correctly, I mean, a lot of things here, okay, they're very abstract, um, but, but it seems like you're using uh, full state uh, feedback, let's say, a full access to the state of the system. Um, what would happen or what would happen computationally if you don't have, like if I want to make a machine for playing a Texas Hold'em card game where I can only have partial observations, let's say, of the state. Uh, uh so does your question have to do with imperfect state observation yeah, exactly yes partial or imperfect yeah. Mm. right yeah okay so once you pass into imperfect state observation you're getting a more complicated problem on the other hand it is uh it can be transformed into a perfect state information problem where the state is something much more complicated it is a belief state uh, mm. a probability distribution of where the state is now, uh, that's where approximations are called for, perhaps neural network approximations. And uh, there is not much experience in this area using uh, this type of uh, uh, value space methods, including rollout. However, I have two papers with some collaborators from ASU, Stephanie Gill, and also uh, some of her students. And these papers are over, have been generated over the last couple of years with very challenging, very high dimensional uh, POMDP uh, problems. Mm -hmm. And everything works exactly the same as for lower dimensional problems. Of course, the implementation uh, is more complicated. The offline training takes days to run, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but still, when it comes to online play, it's possible to do it and the results seem to be quite encouraging. So that's all I can say. Uh, it's a very interesting area for many people to work on. There are efforts uh, in various communities, and, yeah. but um, but the, my work, the two papers I mentioned, is the ones that close more closely relate to the viewpoints I've expressed today. Mm -hmm. Right. Could I also ask if you could share some other insight? I mean, your, your framework, I think, it's, it's very beautiful. Conceptually explains a lot of things that we can see. Uh, but algorithmically, I mean, you mentioned a little bit to roll up of rollout optimization could be challenging. But do, do you also have some, say, algorithmic insight that you can share of, of how this could transform the way we do computations, not just an analysis, say, and, and conceptually structured algorithms? I think the computation is, is feasible. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Uh, based on my experience with the POMDP problems, which were horrendously complicated, uh, I can tell you that's feasible. You have to be clever about it. You have to be lucky about it. Uh, but, uh, but we have used a lot of distributed computation to do all this. And like mm -hmm. I said, training for days. So as the availability of parallel computation increases, uh, it's going to have a big effect because a lot of these uh, data in database uh, uh, the computations can be parallelized. For example, Monte Carlo simulation is eminently parallelizable. So it's not as hard or prohibitive as it used to be. Mm -hmm. And in the future, it's going to be more accessible. So a lot of the things that uh, in the past had seemed to be uh, out of the realm of feasibility may become feasible or are feasible right now. Uh, so I'm optimistic in that regard. The computational resources are just so plentiful that, uh, and uh, that uh, that that gives me a lot of hope. Sounds excellent. I I think we have one more question before concluding. Uh, Jing Zhao. Let's see. Uh, yes. Thanks for thanks, Professor, for your talk. And uh, it's really interesting. I, actually, I have two questions, but in terms of the time, you may just answer one of them. Uh, I can stay on uh, if anyone wants to stay beyond. I'll, I'll be. I'll, I can. I can stay on the problem. Yep. Yeah. Go okay. ahead, please. Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, it's about. Yeah, I can. In term, uh, you mentioned that it's a uh, linearization of the of some uh, the Newton. Uh, it's a Newton step and a linearized uh, function or uh, operator. And then when 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 you turn 
talk about this uh, subgradient, how did you define the proximity or the uh, metric in the function space? Because in terms of the Fraser derivative of this operator, you have to, I am curious about, about the, uh, the metric in this space. And secondly, you, it's a monotone concave function. And I'm curious about what's the dual of this function look like, because it's, you, there might be another physical meaning of the dual of the function. Uh, that's all my question. Thank you. Um, yes, even though the problem may be discrete, the state space may be discrete, like uh, a finite number of states, five states, 10 states, 100 states. The Bellman equation is defined over real valued functions, right? Uh, and that's why you can talk about convexity. And the metric there is, uh, okay, you're dealing with function spaces, Euclidean space perhaps. So that's, uh, that's what you use. You could consider the possibility of dual functions. I guess what you, you would call conjugate, con convex conjugate functions. But I haven't found any use for that so far, but it's, it's a possibility. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, yeah. Uh, okay, excellent. I think we should we can uh, uh, conclude here. And if there are people that still have questions for, for Professor Bertsekas, uh, maybe you can just stay on, stay on, and uh, and those of us that want to continue discussing a little bit more can do so. So, with that, I think we conclude. And uh, thank you so much. I, I I wish we could all applaud, <laughs> also uh, or <laughs> with the sound, but but we do it with our little reactions. And thank you very much for everything. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity, and it was a pleasure to give this talk. I'd like to say hello to a few friends whose I see, whom I see in the audience here, David and Ben and Mark. Um, Excellent. So I, I will. I think in now there's so so few people left. So those of you that want to to speak to to Dimitri can just unmute and <laughs> and we'll we'll sort out. I I think I my question that I was similar to the one of Mike Mikael that um, one of the reasons why you would use policy iteration, for example, is that you do not have a a um, model of the system or the rules of the system that would allow you to do look ahead. But I guess this, uh, most of the methods that you have talked about in this presentation does assume some, some model of the system. Right, you need to have a model. Like in MPC, you need to have a model. On the other hand, you may be estimating the model online, and um, and uh, that's that's a limitation. Um, if you look at the problems where you don't have a model, then you are in the area of dual control. What's called dual control in uh, in traditional stochastic control theory. It's a concept that goes back to the to the sixties, and people have been trying to deal with that also in conjunction with adaptive control for decades. And it's one of the great uh, challenges of, uh, of uh, control theory. And I don't think that you're going to solve them with reinforcement, solve this problem with reinforcement learning methods. The problems are very fundamental. So basically, uh, I think that uh, uh, it's, it's not very clear how you deal with, uh, with this unknown or changing models. It's uh, uh, certainly in my talk today, I have assumed a known model um, and only by, uh, I, I have hand waved when it came to estimating a model and using the estimate. In practice, you would do that, but whether this is sound or not, it's not very clear to me. All right, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, David, do you think we could get a handle on that problem of how to select rollout horizon? I mean, do, do you have any more insight in that? Uh, for sure, I mean, 
you could say, okay, the longer the better. But is that is that always true? The longer the better. I know I my video broke. Uh, actually, not. Uh, and uh, one can construct interesting examples where uh, the uh, where the uh, you increase the length of the rollout horizon and the, the performance becomes worse. Uh, basically, uh, you okay with the. Uh, with rollout with a policy, you push the starting point of the Newton step close to the cost of that policy. On the other hand, you don't really want to go at the cost of that policy. You want to go close to the optimal cost and apply the Newton step there. Now, how do you choose the, uh, the rollout horizon to do that? It's not very clear. On the other hand, in practice, this can be the result by some kind of experimentation. Basically, that's, I mean, that's, uh, there's no theory that can guide you about the length of the horizon because what's a good horizon also depends on J tilde, the starting point. And uh, that's, that cannot be predicted very easily. Um, so it's an interesting question to deal with both practically and perhaps it's also theoretically. Um, I had another question. You talked about alpha zero now, but there's also, are you familiar with the method mu zero? That's also from DeepMind. Yeah. Do you have uh, any comment about that? <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, I've actually looked at uh, uh, this mu zero paper, not very carefully, but one statement struck me that uh, Monte Carlo's research is not very good. Uh, for the for for as it, as it, I mean, we've been hearing from Deep Mind about how good Monte Carlo research is, and people have been trying to use Monte Carlo research in all kinds of contexts, even though, even contexts where it was implausible that it would be well suited. Now the same Alpha Zero Deep Mind people are telling us that 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 Monte Carlo research is not good, and. Uh, uh, and uh, so I don't know what to believe, uh, but I have done my own experimentation about Monte Carlo research. Uh, and I have found that it's a hit or miss proposition. Sometimes it doesn't work at all. And no matter how hard you try, other times it may work. And if you look at how the method works, you can see that that's probably the case. Now, depending on application, it may work very well. And I think that in alpha zero, it has been, at least I've been told that it has been a major contributor to success because it prunes intelligently the look ahead tree and saves on computation time. On the other hand, I don't know how to make out of this new zero. They say that the Monte Carlo research does not work very well and they have rejected it. They have taken it out of the design, but I don't understand the reasons. Just as I did not understand why the original Monte Carlo research worked, I don't understand now why it does not work. So uh, yeah, I have it does... more to learn about New Zero. Perhaps you have some insight that I do not, because no, my reading of the yeah. paper was so superficial. I just know that you know it. It is a more deep, modern deep learning approach where you map everything to a sort of latent vector space where you assume that you can kind of do everything um so it is but it is also less interpretable because of it because you yeah well one of the more controversial viewpoints that uh, of my talk today is that offline training does not matter all that much uh mm. refining a very 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 closely this offline training process, and uh, it's not uh, doesn't make much difference because the Newton step sort of wa washes these differences out. So, is it the deep neural network that make a difference? Uh, I mean, Tesoro's uh, work does not use a deep neural network; it uses a, a two-stage network, uh, and uh, deep is not necessarily better. Maybe it's better for some application, image processing applications. 
but in dynamic programming, well, alpha zero has proved, must have proved, has there's some evidence that it, it has worked. But, uh, uh, but, but whether it works in general or not, I'm not so sure. Uh, I like deep neural networks and the ideas behind them, uh, but uh, I, I am, uh, I, I do not think that it is critical that you use deep neural networks in offline training. Right, thank you. Okay. Professor, I I would like to uh, ask that uh, you mentioned about uh, having this model and, and knowing the model, and you refer to the case that the model could be a simulator as well, right? Because uh, uh, for policy gradient and those type of method, they still need to have a simulator model or whatever to collect the data in the first place. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Yeah, when I say model, I don't necessarily mean equations and probability distributions and the like. It could be a computer model. I mean, a computer model implements a mathematical model. So what I mean by by needing to have a model, it could be a computer model as opposed to the case where you don't have such a model and you're identifying, you need to do system identification. So, so yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, the, uh, a model has a broader meaning in my context. Yeah, sorry, I, my my Zoom crashed. That's why I, I asked the question and then I disappeared. Uh, I, I, I apologize for that. I asked about this uh, rollout uh, length design, but I, I can ask you, you shall later what the answer was. I just wanted to apologize for disappearing. It was not very polite. <laughs> I, I may not yeah, be asked helpful. A lot now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But, but Professor, I think uh, one of your slides that have truncated rollout and this uh, slope actually uh, explain the idea uh, elegantly that you have too long rollout, then the rollout would go to that, uh, that uh, cost function of that particular policy not instead of the uh, Bellman equation solution. I think that figure would explain that it's not necessarily good to have way too long rollout. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, Yu Chao. I think mm -hmm. if you look at the draft of the book, there's a section on this question precisely. Uh, the Great. situation where a longer rollout uh, may help. Uh, but uh, uh, even so, there's no definitive answer on how you do it. It just, you might gain some better understanding about what's going on mm. by looking at this section mm. of the book or the or the figure that uh, you shall mentioned, uh, but uh, uh, but there's uh, it's 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 hard to say uh, how much rollout would be most effective. Mm. On the other hand, there's always a Newton step. Okay, once you have a Newton step, you can afford to you you can play around with different uh, uh, parameters of the design. The Newton step has the power to correct a lot. Yeah. Do, do, do you know in this in TD Gammon, the, the author did he reveal? Uh, I mean, the, the I guess the, the 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 design of TD Gammon did he reveal how, how how that was tuned? I mean, I guess or or Google with Alpha Zero did they also discuss this in, in their own contributions? Well. The Soros paper very explicitly says that it's important not to have a very long rollout. Mm. But the reason that he gave is that it takes a very long time to do a long rollout. And that's why he substituted, he introduced truncation, mm. introducing a cost function approximation at the end of the rollout. Yeah. The Soros had it all figured out, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but he did early. not give any mathematical analysis. Mm. And his uh, motivations were always computational, how yeah. to make the thing work. Because remember, <laughs> the Soros uh, rollout program, it dates to 1996. 
and computers were very primitive at that time. Yeah. And for Tesoro to play a single game of backgammon, he had to pull together uh, a lot of workstations at IBM Research Center to work all night in order to play a single game uh, because uh, Monte Carlo simulation was involved and it was important to use parallel computation and also to keep the length of truncated rollout short. Mm. That was a good use of, of computing resources in the end. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's amazing. Uh, Tesoro has been amazing in this field and, I'm and, I'm, and I think that his, uh, his great influence and great contributions have not been fully appreciated. Unfortunately, in this field of reinforcement learning, memory is very short. Yes. Uh, stretches back to a few years. <laughs> Anything that's been done 20 years ago or longer is as if it never existed. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. It's, it's a many fields. I guess it's, yeah. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's a more general problem. Oh, yeah. Uh, People tend yeah. to be forgotten so yes. fast. Yes. Great. But, but not you, Dimitri. We will not forget you. Yeah. <laughs> It's good to hear, but uh, I'm not sure I can hold you to it. <laughs> <laughs> Great, this was fantastic. Um, so I guess we should conclude. And uh, I know you, you work with Kalle, Yu Xiao, and so on. So that's fantastic. I hope you be able to come to visit us at KTH in the, in the non pandemic future, hopefully. Uh, I love your city. I'd love to visit. And also, I hope that we can do some further work and more computation experimentation with meaningful problems. Mm -hmm. And I think there are many possibilities. And working with you, Chao, has been fantastic for me and gave me the opportunity also to connect with your group. It's great. Thank you. All right. So thanks a lot. Um, I, I, I'm leaving. I, yeah. <laughs> also. Thanks and, and, and many, many thanks. Bye for now. Bye. Okay. Thank you much. Thank you, Dimitri. And I will send you the recording. Okay, guys. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'd like to have the recording. Absolutely. I'll fix that. Thank you so much. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.